Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your hosts, Brad Barons and Susan Bratton. I am so thrilled to see everybody here. Welcome to our launch of AdTech Inspire. And we are here today to widen the aperture of our conversation. We're here because the internet, we have the next two days, which are gonna be an incredible two days, and you'll hear all about that tomorrow. The thing that's so exciting about the internet is that it's the biggest thing to happen to the human species in generations. It's up there with the telephone, with the Gutenberg Bible. It's, in, it's bigger than television will ever be. And what we are trying to do is show you the territory here today for inspiration. Because people are doing incredible things with the internet. They're doing incredible things with brands. What you're going to see here is eight slices at the future of things like branding, philanthropy, uh, music, um, uh, your home decoration, everything you can possibly imagine. The internet changes everything, and it changes everything for the better. So I'm so grateful that you're here, yeah. and we're going to have a lot of fun over the course of the next couple of hours. So our first speaker, uh, Hulken Erickson, is the chief technical officer for Erickson. Now, he spells it differently than the company. There's no relation. Apparently, uh, in Stockholm, it's like Smith, uh, Erickson, and Erickson. Uh, he has been with Erickson for 25 years. He is, before the la uh, his eight years as CTO, he was their head of research. Even though he was not born here, uh, he actually lives here. He runs the Silicon Valley office. He's been here for 16 months. When I asked him what his hobbies were, he, there was a long pause, and he mentioned he has an 18-month-old daughter named Matilda. So that seems to be his That's chief his hobby. hobby. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and the reason why Ericsson is important is that they're one of the companies that's building the backbone for the internet. They're the people who are building the infrastructure upon which everything else that we're doing happens. And so Hulken has a special insight into what's happening with the environment in which we all live, play, and work. So please join Susan and I. Welcome to AdTech Inspire. Let's give a warm AdTech welcome to Hulk and Erickson. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. And uh, thank you for having me here at AdTech. As uh, you just heard, I'm uh, with Ericsson, so I'm usually at more communication-oriented conferences, and I'm really, really happy to have the chance to address you with what I think is a very, very interesting part, uh, building the network society, or really building the backbone between the, all the devices and the cloud that people spend so much talking about, but really the connectivity and everything that comes in between is very, very, very important. And if you spend your whole life working with that, you get some insights also what's happening there and what that might mean to to the cloud and to the devices and the opportunities, what you can do. So that's what I would like to spend some time on. Before that, though, I would see if this is working. OK, can I have next slide, please? And then there should be a video coming.
So that is what happens in one minute, and that was how long that video took. It's a lot, a lot, a lot of things getting connected and activated. And in fact, there are 30 mobile phones sold every second. As I used to always say, the human ear can hear down to 20 hertz. So that is 30 hertz. You should be able to hear the amount of mobile phones being sold every 24 hours a day. And that is the pace of the, the communication industry. And this is still just the beginning. We think that by 2020, everything that can benefit from a network connection will be connected. And in fact, the device that is not connected will be seen as a dead device. So why, why is this not working almost? Because it's not connected. You cannot retrieve information. It cannot give information to the internet that you can later pick up somewhere else and know what has happened to your, your thing. And we have from that created the vision that led towards 20 billion connected devices. In 10 years, 2020, there will be 50 billion connected devices. And this is to put it in perspective. Ericsson was founded in 1876, so this short is starting where Ericsson started. And we spent the first 100 years connecting places. And in 100 years, we have been able to connect about 1 billion places in the world. Then we spent the next 20 years connecting people and have now connected 5.3 billion people, or at least there are 5.3 billion subscriptions out there. So it's a factor of five that we have done in in 20 years. Now we say, the next 10 years, we will connect 50 billion things. Then, of course, you can go into a long, lengthy discussion about what is the definition of a connected thing, and what speeds, and uplink, downlink, and so on. That's not so important. The important thing is that it is 10 times more than 5. So it's something must be different. Everything might have to be different. You cannot have a SIM card in all these 50 billion devices. How, how will you solve the processing power? How do you solve the connectivity? How do you solve the battery? How do you solve? There are lots of things that you have to solve. So that's what we have started working on. But it, all, and it will only take 10 years to do 50 billion compared to the 100 years it took to do 1 billion. So this will be very, very different. How will they be connected? <clears throat> well, they will not be wireless, wireless like wire connections. They will be wireless connections. That is thanks to technology. These are the speeds. I will not go into the different technologies, what they stand for and why the bit rates are like they are. Just the message is that we will have multi-megabit, up to gigabit speeds in these wireless connections. So what we are about to do right now is to build what I call a invisible or maybe even invincible multi-megabit connectivity layer that is available everywhere. And once you have that, you have my whole presentation at once, at least here. There we go back, and now we're there again. Good. So when we have that, you know, we don't really know what kind of applications that will be developed on top of that. And I think that's, in fact, really, really interesting, because it would be quite boring to know already now. I only know, we know that if you go back 10 years, there were like, 50 million mobile subscriptions in the world instead of 5 billion. So lots of things happen in 10 years. So the coming 10 years will be very dramatic when you have this connectivity layer available. And this is another way to see the same thing. The number of mobile broadband subscriptions will be five times or six times as high as the fixed broadband. The whole world is changing from having your fixed connection, broadband connection, DSL at home, to always have a mobile connection. This is, of course, a global perspective. So in many parts of the world, there is no fix to connect to. The world starts with mobile. The world starts wireless. The first internet connection you have is your mobile phone, and then you build from there. And this is not so surprising, because if you remember the former slide, the fixed and the mobile connections, there was a 5 to 1 ratio, 5 billion, 1 billion. This is basically the same ratio that still holds true when you go to mobile to broadband. So we'll have a world that 50 billion connected devices all over wireless, which will give a, if you look at it from an architecture or world, what will it look like? You will have a world where you have different kinds of wireless connectivity. There will be Wi-Fi, of course, and there will be different kinds of 3G and 4G. And you will move around between these different connectivities uh, with subscriptions, and maybe sometimes you can do it without any subscription, depending on which, which connectivity you're using. But somebody will, of course, have to pay for this. This will not just come for free. 
But they hold, it will be about finding the shortest distance from your antenna to another antenna, and from that antenna through a fiber to the cloud, cloud which means this uh, wireless connection and the fiber and that whole network so important. So a very, maybe the most simplified picture you could do over what the world will look like and what are the important building blocks seen from our perspective is these three components. The mobility, the broadband, and the cloud building up the network society. The mobility there are with the devices. I will come back a little bit more to the devices and the operating systems in this slide, but there are devices that are very, very advanced, great displays, great video capabilities, great connectivity, all wirelessly connected to the cloud where all the services basically will reside so you can reach them from whenever you are with whatever device. And then in between, there is the importance of a broadband connectivity that I, with this little hat on top of, try to depict as, as the smart pipe. It has to be a smart pipe because the, the ones to operate it will have to have intelligence in them to be able to, first of all, manage the whole network, but secondly, also be able to charge for it in a clever way so that, in fact, there will be money floating in to the people building the connectivity so that there will be connectivity built. Because if we take, assume that that will be for free, nobody will build it and we will have no connectivity on which to build all these fancy applications that resides in the cloud and run on the devices. With this connectivity built out, we will have a world with everything basically running on top of it, either because it's more efficient, it's safer, it's more fun, or whatever reason. But there are, will be eff efficiency gains taken here. It will be sustainability gains. It will be, from a green perspective, all kinds of reasons. People will start utilizing this invisible multi-megabit connectivity layer to run advertising, your end-to-end -end business, your consumer to business, all kinds of business on top of this. And these are just examples around here, what you will be able to do. And 10 times more devices than there are people will be connected to this network. What does this mean from then the business perspective that I'm coming to? I said that the data is exploding. We have been measuring now for many, many years how much data. Ericsson has to understand, we have about a 40% market share in the mobile network, 40%. So we can measure in the networks worldwide and see what is actually going on. And from that, we can extract this data. And Christmas 2009, that was when data passed voice in the mobile networks. Two years earlier, it was almost invisible compared to the voice. Then it has doubled every year since then. So now we are soon coming up to three times as much data as we have voice in the networks. If you double something five times, it becomes 30 times as large. So by 2015, it will be 30 times as much data as voice. If you double it again, another five years until this year 2020, we have talked about then you have doubled it 10 times. If you double something 10 times, it becomes 1,000 times as large. So in 2020, we might be able to have to carry 1,000 times as much data as we now carry voice. And that's why I'm saying voice is noise. The voice will basically be invisible in those networks. And then the whole business model for the network operators that are today running this network will have to change. We are flipping it completely upside down. When the world was only voice, then it made, sound, made sense to count voice minutes and charge the end subscriber for voice minutes. And you can give away the data flat fee. That was sort of no big deal. Now when the data is the dominating part, it's very, if you look at 2015, to count the blue voice minutes there and give away the data for free doesn't make much sense. Then you can start giving away the voice, but you have to know what goes on in your pipe. That's why it has to be a smart pipe. Then you can charge for it both down to the end consumer or up to this content provider in different ways depending on what capabilities the pipe have. I don't think we, it will definitely not be flat rate anymore, $20 or you can eat. That will be gone. Will it be a gigabyte, this and this much per gigabyte, and then you have to pay depending on how many gigabytes you consume? Maybe, but I think that is a little bit too sort of unsophisticated model. That is sort of the PG&E model. You just count kilowatt hours and then charge you for that. Um, 
People say that maybe you cannot do it for gigabyte because people don't know what a gigabyte is. I claim that people don't know what a kilowatt hour is either, really. And if they do, they have, they have done it by learning over time. And that's what people most likely do, will do with gigabytes also. And if people really didn't know why, why, what a gigabyte was, I don't think Apple would basically categorize the whole iPad and iPod scheme after how many gigabytes they have. So that's the first question you get when you have bought an iPod or an iPad. How many gigabytes did you buy? If people don't know what a gigabyte is, that would not be the first question. So I, I, I think that that could be a model. But I hope that it will be more sophisticated than that, that you really look into the capabilities of the pipe and say, I want to be able to speak. I want to do voice calls. OK, then you need short. Then you need a real-time pipe. I want to do gaming. Then you need a real-time pipe with really, really short latency. I want to, to just download some movies in the background. I don't really care when I get them. Then you can, don't need Then You can do a best effort pipe and so on. And then you will say, well, real time, that's $5 per month. Short latency, that's $15 per month. V voice streaming, uh, video streaming, all you can do, that's 25 plus some per gigabyte. That one I will charge per gigabyte. And so and then you will sort of tick in the box what you want, and then you get 10% discount if you tick all the boxes, something like that. But of course, there will be thinking, people think about how can you get advertising into this, and how can advertising help charging for the pipe? But that's what I'm saying. What you need is a smart pipe so that you can start playing with this, both upstream and downstream in the pipe, and see. Because operators will, of course, have to start now competing. Because if they will only compete on offering you the lowest per gigabyte price, that would be a boring business model for all of us, I guess. So if you could, some sort of a pipe that is smart enough to create creativity in charging for it, depending on how you do it. This is the operating systems that will be in these pipes. And you can see green there is Android. This is Q third quarter 2009, this is third quarter 2009. This is only one year of development in smartphones. And you can see how Android has come basically from nowhere to taking one quarter of the market and passing Apple iPhone. And how purple there is Windows and blue is uh, Symbian. It's really, if you just look, that's one reason why I am now based here. I used to be in Stockholm for many years, at least 25 years. Now I'm based here since one and a half year. This is what is driving the change in this market is the green and the yellow. And that is basically Mountain View and Cupertino. And with the green especially, you will see smartphones coming down in much lower cost segments than $500. They will come down in $100 because there will be so many others making smartphones on that operating systems. So that's basically where I will end. We are saying that we have just started this. Now there are a lot of technologies there in the bottom. You don't have to go into the detail, but this is the word population coverage. 2G, that's yellow. That's basically covered now. 3G is blue, and 4G is green. And as you can see, we have just started. So with more coverage in the world, in 3G and 4G, and with smartphones coming down in lower dollar segments, we are going to see an explosion around the world on mobile broadband and the people you can reach through the smart pipe. So we're just starting. OK, so will the operators be able to do anything of this? I will not dwell in detail on this. I can only say that the dark blue there, that's the mobile data. That's the only thing that is growing. Everything else is flat. So basically, the only message in this slide is the, it's the mobile broadband that is the growth in the connectivity business. That's where the top line growth is. And the bottom line growth is also there. So what I wanted to convey was that we'll go into a world based on mobility, broadband, and cloud. And all three are equally important. You can't get away with a cloud and an iPad only. Then there is, both of them are very meaningless unless you have a smart connectivity in between. And that is what builds up the network society. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. So that was a great kickoff. And I'm thrilled that you're all here. And it's, it's great to see such a full room. 
I wanted to take a break between our, this, uh, Hawkins' wonderful presentation and our next presenter to thank two very special sponsors. You'll see Kasali Media. If we can give a big round of applause to make it possible. They're our keynote room sponsor. Thank you, Kasali. And a, a sponsor that you may not be aware of, but we're delighted that this happened uh, just in the last few days. This session, the AdTech Inspire and uh, the keynotes over the next couple of days are being, for the first time ever, live streamed. And that is thanks to our friends at YouTube. So if we give a big round of applause to YouTube, not only are you here in this room, but people all over the world are now able to watch what you're watching. So thank you to YouTube. So um, I am thrilled not only that you're all here, but I'm also thrilled that people our constituencies in New York and around the globe are able to see this. So I'm now going to ask my co-host, Susan Bratton, to come back out and introduce our next speaker. Susan is the CEO of Personal Life Media. She is also my predecessor as the head of program at AdTech. Please welcome Susan Bratton. Thanks, Brad. <laughs> I used to get to program all of the AdTech conference, and I really, really enjoyed it. But I don't think I've ever enjoyed programming anything more than this event today. We took it very seriously when Brad came up with the idea of trying to find those few amazing people in our industry that could really inspire you, that could pull you out of traffic and cheap traffic and high conversion mentality and get you thinking at a bigger picture about what you want to accomplish in your life. And when Brad called me or emailed me or whatever to talk about Inspire and he said, who inspires you? The very first person that came to my mind is the person that you are about to meet. Someone that I find incredibly inspiring. Today, you're gonna to get to meet Wendy Lee. Wendy is the CEO of a marvelous, fascinating company called Get Satisfaction. But what she's really gonna talk about is a Buddhist philosophy called the wise and centered mind. And when I called her up to come and present to you today and inspire you, I knew that it would come out of her Buddhist mind that she would think about how to inspire you. She said that she had a lot of cultural epiphanies thinking about corporate culture as it applies to the wise and centered mind. And she's going to tell you about business as performance art. I think that raised the bar right now. Please give Wendy a really welcome round of applause. Wendy Lee. Thank you. Thank you, I think I'll um, stand from this, from this side a bit just to, to get comfortable. So welcome, Monday afternoon, San Francisco. This is a real honor for me. And Susan gave me this assignment. I thought, really? In between all the stuff I'm doing, you're going to stop and try to inspire a group of people in an industry that's already very creative about culture and business. And so indeed, I accepted that challenge. And I'm going to share that with you today. So a little bit about my background, other than the CEO bit. I am from the Deep South, Mississippi. And I was raised by a very young mom. She was 17 when she had me, and she was a Buddhist. Yes, in Mississippi, that's very unusual. And mostly, I just wanted her to dress right and come to be uh, in my homeroom with cookies, right? And constantly, she was meditating under a tree, and it just didn't work for me. I'm like, you know, could you please grow up and just support me the way I want to be supported? And I share that story because a lot of my upbringing has taken me to this new place of leadership that fits so well with Get Satisfaction. So let me give you the scoop. First of all, Get Satisfaction is a network of online communities. Companies and consumers come together to solve problems, share ideas, shout out praise around products and services they care about. So we have 50,000 communities in this massive network. and We've got a team of 30 down the street managing all this. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a big opportunity, and it's kind of perfectly suited to this time. What's interesting, though, is the principles or the culture that the company was founded on. I'm not a founder. We have uh, Thor Mueller, Lane Becker, and Amy Mueller were the founders. And they founded the company on three very important cultural principles. And that manifests in the product. One is trust, one is transparency, and the other is is being open. 
And you say, well, that sounds very cool and kind of of the times. But when you imagine that, like breathing and living in an environment, in a work environment every day, it can get very complex. So in the spirit of being candid, I will tell you that the culture that we have at Get Satisfaction both inspires me and at times, sometimes, it just exhausts me. So as I go through this description, you're going to hear some of my own cultural epiphanies. First of all, you must see the satisfactory. This is our place. It is a circus. It is a circus indeed. So this imagery is perfect. We affectionately call it the satisfactory. It's down the street. And it's a circus of chaos and creativity and connection. And it's online. And it's always on. And it's crazy making at times. We have people that get satisfaction from all academic disciplines, from many different um, sexual preference. They have many different sexual preferences. They are, have many different political affiliations. And we go from the deep south, both coasts, to the Midwest, to Latin America and Europe, too. Can you imagine this in a very small, very energetically inspired space? But let's just call it uh, a, creative, a creative circus for sure. Now, we come together, OK, let's, can you go back one slide? Thank you. Ne next. We come together every day, every day at the, at the satisfactory to do two things. We come together to chase our personal dreams, and goodness, we all have them, and really push, push hard for our professional aspirations. So it sounds fun, yes? It sounds kind of dreamy and inspiring for sure. At the end of the day, though, to lead this kind of culture, to support it, requires two things, complete emotional depth, depth that's really beyond description, and at the same time, a rational mind. So to have that emotionality and a rational mind to keep things pushing forward, we're talking that is the wise and centered mind that the Buddhists have taught, have taught us for years. The good news is that in our shop, the artists, the engineers, and the business people, those that market and sell and develop sp specific solutions, they're really more alike than they think. They get in rat traps, and they get cranky and grumpy. But the truth is they're very, very similar. And when we can kind of point the mirror to them so they can see that they're really talking to each other and to themselves, it makes it a lot easier to deal with. Um, and I think Andy Warhol's quote is the most perfect for me. And I think about this every day in staff meetings and when I'm out on the floor and we're doing stand-ups with the engineers. I think, you know, being good in business is the most fascinating kind of art. Making money is art. And working is art. And good business is the best of art. And that really describes beautifully what we do at Get Satisfaction. So the, the truth of the matter is, this is me. And I feel half the time that I'm on this tightrope. And I feel able to be on the tightrope because of the depth I carry, um, the spiritual depth I carry, and the emotional stability I, that I carry. But I got to tell you, it is something to have to balance. And it's something you have to be so self-aware and so sensitive to all the circumstances that are happening, both inside the shop as well as in the market, as well as in the hands of the 50,000 customers that are using our community to get closer to their own customers. So business, especially business in a social media environment, like we're right in the middle of that vortex, right in between Facebook and Twitter and Foursquare and all those things. It, it is. It is so hyperkinetic, and it, it's so much about very stylized creative art, while at the same time, you're trying to manage the huge expectations of a you know, hyper, every minute, real time business environment. We are a venture backed business, so we're not playing around at it. People are expecting every day that we produce more and more and more results with a similar kind of resource pool. So the pressure of that definitely puts me on the high, the high wire. At the same time, I want to talk about the connection that has to exist between my head and my heart. 
This connection has to be completely unfiltered. It has to be completely clear for us to be able to manage this system that we're dealing with. And I don't mean just our own software, but I mean the system that our software sits in and connects others to. It's really scary. So there's no surprise that we as leaders be of a team, of a company, for-profit, non-profit, we are in a time where the energetics of doing our work are different than they've ever been. This is not the same old culture that our moms and dads grew up with. This is, this is very, very different. It's very upside down. And in a way that should be extremely creative and should rise us all to our highest and best potential if we would allow that. I see, though, restraints and constraints that people put in themselves, even in their own professional workspace, like, well, I can't do that. Well, I'm not sure. Well, I don't have enough. Well, I'm saying you do. There's infinite abundance of everything you need right here, right now. You don't have to wait. Take this time right now and be a bigger and better you so we can achieve the whole of what we're supposed to achieve for our own business. So there are a couple of things. This is a stat that I think is very interesting. Right now, this is based on a Gallup poll, $350 billion is wasted every year with employees that are not engaged. Now, how could that be? Between Twitter and Facebook and texting and laptops and everything we have to stay connected, how is it that that amount of money is being wasted? And yet, when I'm in our own shop at the satisfactory, you know, I'm thinking, is it true that we're all connected but we're not engaged? What is it? It seems weird, right, that we could all be on all the time, but somehow when I'm in a meeting, I feel like no one's present, like I'm trying to explain something or trying to, you know, put an idea forward, and I feel like people are like out of their bodies floating around. Like, what is that? It's the weirdest experience. I'm always saying, stay here now. <laughs> stay here now. What do you think now, present? Not like this, just right now. Can you be with me so we can kind of see the next phase or the next hour or even the next quarter? It's very interesting how that we can really engage people. Now, I love it as a marketer, and I know many of you are, you talk about online engagement, brand engagement, consumer engagement. Well, you know, talk about employee engagement. It's a little different, I think, right? I don't think you send them a campaign. Right? I don't think you make them an offer. Right? It's very, very different to get that emotional sensitivity lined up with goals and objectives that frankly need to be achieved. And maybe achievement's not the cool word anymore, but give me a new one right? so we can bring all this together and be proud of what we've accomplished. So I, I think this whole notion of co being connected versus engaged is something that I really, it's not a struggle, I'm just amazed by and I'm constantly trying to understand it better. So I'm going to tell you a little about a meltdown I had a couple of, I have meltdowns, it's a southern thing. It's called a hissy fit where I grew up in Mississippi, but meltdowns probably sounds more sophisticated in San Francisco. But I was having one of these meltdowns when I, I, a couple of epiphanies hit me. First of all, I realized that get satisfaction's ultimate um, success was not tied to process excellence. It wasn't tied to process excellence, right? It just wasn't attached to that. It wasn't tied to some wiki collaborative platform that many of my colleagues sell. It wasn't tied to that. It wasn't tied to shiny MacBooks. We've got plenty of them. It wasn't tied to, let me look at my list here, comfy couches because all of my employees want them. They want them with colors and, you know, futons and all that. It wasn't really tied to latte machines. They want that too. It really is tied to one thing. It's really tied to the creative capital, right? It's really tied to this big, wide open space of complete abundance that they can find by hooking up the energy of up here to down here and then bringing in their colleagues into that space. That's really what they need. Now, what amazes me, though, after I kind of had that, you know, meltdown, I also thought about, well, you know, 
Don't be irritated when they want ritual coffee. Normal coffee, they don't want Starbucks. They want ritual coffee. We've got to have organic snacks. You know, can't be the normal ones. We've got to have organic ones. They want to listen to music with their earbuds. Well, that's pretty cool. They check in all the time, either in Gowalla or Foursquare or places. Well, sometimes when they check in, it looks like they're checking out, but I try not to be judgmental about that. Um, I'm like, come back, come back, please. Where did you go? Back here, back here. But then I realized in their hoodie-wearing you know, outfit, sitting in their very expensive Aaron chairs, right? This is my space. Welcome to my music. Um, they're really thinking some way out there expansive thoughts. So I say to myself, my own cultural epiphany, that is really what you want for yourself. Look, you're surrounded by all that you want for yourself. Here you are in my fourth or fifth business. I'm kind of a junkie about this stuff, about startup life. And I'm surrounded by the very thing that I've always wanted. Yet sometimes I get frustrated because I can't control it. And I don't know if you've experienced that, but it is a wild, wild thought. So as I'm moving on and moving on, I want to give you some ideas here. Here's a few. First of all, there's a big secret I want to share. Many of your employees, many of my employees don't even trust me. And they may not even, yours may not trust you. This is the truth, right? They think sometimes I'm from another planet because I really like work. They don't always. They don't always like it. And what I get get by with quite a bit is just a likability factor. I'm from the South, right? So I can kind of be very stern, but still keep a smiling face. And that likability factor is encouraging. Here's some stats. 38% of employees think their leaders, only 38% think their leaders even have a sincere interest in their well-being. Only 38%. Only 47% think their leaders are trustworthy. Only 42% think their leaders inspire. The list goes on. According to Richard Florida, and I'm sure you guys know him, one-third of the workers belong to the creative class. The rest are bankers. Sorry if you're a banker. And this is what it looks like, right? The creative class. This is the class that we are now pulling into our psyche and building businesses for tomorrow. They are the ones that have the juice to make this happen. And it's those of us, like myself, that have the wonderful opportunity, the honor, to participate with them in this new opportunity. We at Get Satisfaction, and in my own cultural epiphanies, I've come up with these particular threads that I put into our silver silver lining. Number one, I really allow myself and them to fail as long as they fail fast. This is not, I'm sure you've heard this before, but when you're in a business that's under as much pressure as ours and the market is so interesting and compelling and vibrant and accessible, if you're gonna fail, you've gotta fail fast. Second thing is, I always reward resilience. Resilience is where it's happening. So I have to make sure that's rewarded. The third thing is to iterate and innovate organically, not in a process workshop, not because you're now time to innovate. This should be happening all the time. And and all of that is so you can deliver spectacular results that inspire others. It's not just spectacular results for yourself or for the organization. It is so your colleague next to you can also see that model and want to do it for themselves. And then as a result of that, the company succeeds. So the truth is, I'm a lucky girl from the Deep South. I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I have learned that business can be integrated and aligned with art in a way that's completely magical. This is the kingdom that I live in. It's a kingdom that I'm very proud of. It's more, it's like a circus in a river of tweets, like a kaleidoscope, right? Throwing unstructured color on the walls, trying to figure it out. And now it's time for me to head back down the road to my circus in Soma. And I'm gonna leave you with these, with a couple of things. First of all, as a leader, in these creative times, please observe and don't judge. And I'm saying this to myself as I'm saying it to you. Please observe and and don't judge. This crowd does not respond to that. Number two, engage, don't demand. 
Number three, lead through influence. I know you've heard that many, many times. Don't lecture and prescribe. Don't get your mother's finger out and wag it at your employees. Be strong and vulnerable rather than hide or master weakness or your emotion. And finally, keep the tension of the heart and the head because that is the wise and centered mind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy. Okay, so I want you to take a break from looking at me for a minute, and I just want you to look around the room and look at yourselves. So you're all people who've made time to come to a place where you're going to learn, where you're going to meet people, where you're going to have, get new ideas, you're going to share your ideas, and that's very exciting. This industry, I mean, I, I could be running a show for, you know, the, the, some, on some other industry that doesn't change radically every six weeks, but this one does. And it's impossibly exciting because I can't keep up, right? I have, we have people that I rely on to help me keep up because you all are the people who are the, the, the pioneers and the revolutionaries, the dreamers and the engineers of our future. And what I rely on are people who know that I'm always looking for a good story. And they have their ears to the ground. They know what's happening, and they tell me. One of the people who's about to join us on stage has his ear to the ground. Rennie Gleason is the director of interactive strategy for Wyden and Kennedy. He is the guy who listens for the stories, and then he uses those stories to advise companies like Nokia, Nike, Coca-Cola, and many others. We live near each other in Oregon, but we only actually manage to see each other at conferences because we're both on planes all the time. So in addition to being thrilled just to see him, I'm also thrilled that he's here to share with you two ideas that don't really seem to go together until he explains it. And those are the ideas of com combining brands and hacking. So to figure out what this is, let's give a warm welcome to Renny Gleason. Thanks. I always feel like there should be a tape that you rip through there. Um, hello, thank you for uh, coming in today. And uh, my, what I'm going to be chatting about is brand hacking. Uh, a, a topic that intrigues me a, a pretty decent amount. And I'm going to start with a statement by this guy. Uh, this guy is BJ Fogg. He heads up the Stanford University Persuasive Technology Lab. And he's a guy who has worked for governments, he's worked for companies, he's done a bunch of interesting things. But the quote that, that knocked me out was he said, I've given up on governments and religions to solve the world's challenges. He said, they've done more than most to create conflicts and divisions. And, that, and this, was, this was the one that got me. I believe, I, I have it written down so I'm not just BSing you, I believe our hope for a better world lies in the hands of multinational corporations with global perspective. Bam! Now why, why would he say that? He, he would say that for a couple of different reasons. One of them is that those multinational corporations with global perspective are looking around. They, they benefit from stable markets. They benefit from uh, distribution networks you can count on. They benefit from people being able to afford their products. So they, admittedly, there's something in it for them. If you look at Cory Doctorow, uh, he's a science fiction writer. He wrote this book, this most recent one, For the Win. And in that, he predicts a future where uh, brands are creating massive multiplayer online games. And he says that the power of these games is so strong that when they dictate a monetary value, it stands. So the example he gave was 76 groats equals one axe. And that was in the Coca-Cola game uh, that he had talked about. Now, the interesting thing about that was that that's science fiction. That came out uh, a couple months ago, uh, but reality has already passed it. I wanted to share with you some numbers. These are major platforms with user populations of over 200 million people. At the top, you're probably familiar with the uh, uh, platform called China uh, at 1.3 billion. Uh, India has about 1.2 billion users. Uh, down at number three is Coca-Cola. Uh, Coca-Cola has about 1.2 billion users, and those are servings per day. Tencent, another Chinese company, at about 636 million, these are reported numbers, uh, 636 million introduced a virtual currency called QQ Coins. 
QQ coins were being traded and had a direct market value in the same way that gold in World of Warcraft has a direct market value. But the problem was at that scale, 636 million people, the government actually had to ban the coins because they were at risk of destabilizing the Chinese currency. Facebook is down around 600, I mean, come on, that's amazing. That Facebook is down around 600 million people. Then you get down to Qzone at 480 million, and MSN Messenger at 330 million, and then squeaking in at the end, you have the United States and Indonesia. Uh, yeah, 311 million, 237 million. So you, you, the interesting thing though is not, because you're gonna hear a lot about, oh, Facebook as a, uh, if it were a country, it'd have a certain population. But what's interesting about that is, you take a look at which of those brand platforms have translated across borders. Coca-Cola is in over 200 countries. Facebook reports 95 countries, 60 plus on mobile, MSN Messenger at 50. And you look at those silly doddering national platforms just struggling along at only one country worth of real penetration. So it's an interesting comparison, an interesting comparison to look at. So looking at that in that context, that's what gets me interested in hacking and brand hacking. Because what brands have through their distribution and their product is a reach that many countries are salivating for. So hacking, brief definition, to make something do something it was never intended to do. Very often people think of hacking as a pure technology base, but for purposes of this few minutes, um, think about it a little more broadly. This is one of my favorites. This is a, a Lego hack where somebody took an LED and jammed it into the head and made a leg ghoul. Awesome. My kids love that. Or this one, I can tell you that Sanrio and Coca-Cola did not get together to endorse this product. It's jewelry uh, made out of a Coke can, shape of Hello Kitty. You can buy it on Etsy, and I included the uh, link so you can purchase it yourself. Parent Hacks is a website where um, parents come together and they find solutions using brands. If you talk to the folks who run the site, they'll tell you that they look at IKEA and Target as their toolkit. So here, one of their examples is uh, Sharpies plus Spirograph equals wall art for the kids' room. And the challenge as a marketer or a brand is you look at that and you go, Gah! it's off-label usage of the product. I can't promote that. But if you look at that the way I would look at that, that's an increased bundle, an increased basket size, a potential additional purchase. That's a basket of products you might be able to sell on that website. So brand hacking, you take the hacking, which is happening right now with your brands all around the world, Brand hacking, the idea is using brand tools in unexpected ways to create unexpected value. Here, so now brands can look at all this stuff going on and rather than just watch it from afar, from behind the legal walls, you can find ways to potentially collaborate and conspire with those folks. On the left, you see Johnny Lee. Johnny Lee is the guy who put together with a couple of Wiimote, uh, he hacked a system that made uh, Wii a three-dimensional head tracking system. Pretty incredible. But what was more interesting was in the five months, the five, it took five months from when he posted the video sharing that hack on YouTube to Lewis Castle from EA seeing that hack and introducing it as an Easter egg within mass, uh, mass market title, Boom Blocks. So if you play Boom Blocks, there is a hidden thing. If you, if you do this little hack, you can actually get a 3D thing. So in that particular case, the brand found a way to take one of those hacks and bring it to market. The filter, is not, because there are thousands of things you can do. You can spend all your time on Etsy and YouTube and DIY and Makeables and Structables every, anywhere, and you can find all this stuff. But the key is, you've got to let your brand voice be the guy with who you're going to work with and how you're going to partner. So very quickly, with my remaining time, I want to present to you guys some thoughts about platforms you can hack as a brand. The five I'm going to talk about are distribution, data, people, communications, and product. So what I'm hoping you'll do after this is go back and think about those five buckets, and you'll probably add more buckets than that. And think about ways that you could hack those and use those as a creative palette, even before you start thinking about quote unquote advertising. So let's start with distribution. Some folks would look at the side of this Coke truck and see a bunch of crates of Coke. Other people would look at that and see the raw materials to build the world's largest supporter at the World Cup in South Africa, right, out of Coke crates. So back to that truck. If you were Simon Barry in Northeast Zambia and you were a doctor and the problem that you were facing was that you couldn't get vaccines out to where you were in time due to refrigeration and distribution issues, you would see something different. You would look at that truck and you would see an opportunity. 
you would see the spaces between the necks of the bottles as unused territory, and you would make this, a cardboard container called the aid pod that you can pack vaccines into and ship in the truck. You could actually be saving lives with a negative space in your distribution network. That's kind of interesting. You could look at an Amazon box and see, of course, a kitty litter box or a kitty bed. But what's cuter than a cat? Yes, a robot. A robot is much cuter than, than a cat. So Amazon Japan built a little uh, robot toy, right, out of the boxes that they had. But that wasn't enough. That generated buzz. That got people interested in it. But then they went and they actually sell it. You can buy this thing for the equivalent of $26 online. Thank you very much. You can buy our boxes as advertising for us and put it in your home. Nice. Another distribution hack I love is Facebook. So Facebook is attempting to spread its footprint more broadly. In a lot of countries, uh, there's pretty significant access for mobile devices. So what Facebook did was they said, well, th there's an issue. We can, we can get in with mobile because PC penetration might not be what it needs to be. We can get in with mobile, um, but the data plans aren't there. So, oh, oh, right. What we'll do, because our acquisition cost, we know exactly how much a new customer costs, it costs us less to subsidize the carriers in these 45 countries to allow people to access Facebook for free. This is zero.facebook, if you've, if you've taken a look at it. It's a stripped down version, knocks out a lot of the photographs, but basic functionality is there. We'll step on to the next one, data. Jur Thorpe was sitting and talking to a uh, uh, microbiologist and a, a disease specialist, and they were talking about the spread of the H1N1 virus. He wondered whether or not you could take the data that was publicly available, the publicly available data from Facebook and from Twitter, uh, where people, if you've ever done this, you tweet taking off at or landing in a particular airport. I've done it. It was stacking up on this chart. So what they did was they built this chart that would capture from all the publicly available information, lift off and landings, so that they could try to visualize the potential spread of viruses and map it back. What's neat about that, actually, is that the New York Times has now brought him in as a digital artist in residence. Data is a contrail that brands leave behind. From the moment that raw materials are created, grown, gathered, through the manufacturing process, you're leaving a data contrail. And that data contrail is not going away, and it's potentially a business driver. Looking at your R&D, your testing and prototyping, raw materials manufacturing, all through the line, there's data being spun off. I love this barcode for uh, Coca-Cola, the Coke-shaped bottle code. So every time that product moves through, another piece of data is posting. What can you do with that? What are the businesses you could create? There's beauty being created by it right now. I had a this data uh, scientist was talking to me. He said, data has a grain. You just have to find out what it wants to tell you. This was an interesting stat. Uh, in Q4 of 2010, Verizon and AT&T both signed up more devices for data plans than human beings. You saw the presentation that began this pod, and you saw the acceleration rate of that. These are Coca-Cola freestyle machines, which allow you to go up and customize a particular product. You can get any flavor you want, multiple different things. You know, diet cherry, vanilla flavored, it's like it's crazy. But those things are gonna be able to talk back. So now what you love actually feeds out and becomes a conversation. So think about that. Think about the different pieces within your network that create data and what that might be able to build. We had an opportunity to work with Nike and a company called Deep Local uh, to build the Chalkbot. And what the Chalkbot was, was a way that you could text or tweet messages which would then be sprayed on the ground at the Tour de France in front of the riders at each stage. And the messages were messages in support of people living, fighting, and dealing with the implications of cancer. What was interesting about that was that was a brand, a technology, and an opportunity to actually create a new form of communication. So I challenge you, as you're looking at your communications, is there a way to build a platform out of what you're doing and not just an ad? Your people, okay, this was 12 Force, which uh, Best Buy, I'm sure you're familiar with the case study. Uh, effectively, what they did was they just took the uh, sales associates and they made them available online. All it was was using Twitter to expand the customer service footprint more broadly. But what's really interesting about that is you also get a demand generation engine, 
right? The questions that people are asking those folks tell your people what you should be stocking, what you should be looking at, which can in turn propel conversations with suppliers, people, and then product. So anybody here, show of hands, who's ever walked around a house using the screen of your mobile device as a flashlight at night? Yes! Um, so Nokia actually took a look and saw that folks were doing this uh, in areas where power uh, was of limited uh, availability. And what they did was they added an LED flashlight, a very low power LED flashlight to the top of the device. So in this particular case, you have a product that followed the hack that people were using. That is one of my favorites. Uh, Daiji Zhang is a young lady who lives in Ningbo, China. And what she found online was a research paper from Sony engineers that talked about the um, use of organic sugars as a power source. She did some math and figured out that one can of Coke is the equivalent of five hours of battery life for a device. She worked this prototype out. The interesting thing is that once the sugars are consumed by the device, you actually get filtered water on the tail end of that. The fun thing here was calling up Nokia and saying, hey, guys, could you build this? And their engineers, took a little while, uh, but their engineers came back and said, I'm going to butcher it. I'm not, I don't have a good accent. It would be sticky, but it would work. <laughs> Daniel Fletcher, another doctor, was dealing with the fact that uh, the area, the region that he was in had very high HIV AIDS rates, but people weren't being tested. The reason why they weren't being tested was because of the trip it took to get to the blood spectrometer, which was usually in a major city with an intermittent power source, which meant you were out of your wages, salary, and time to go and get your blood tested, which you kind of didn't, you know, dodgy prospect. What he did was he took a, a device, a Nokia device, and image quality was enough that if he put a, a microscope attached to the back of it, he could snap a picture, send it via MMS, and you could be diagnosed within an hour. So, putting this out to the group here. Innovate, collaborate, let your voice be your guide. I tried to just give you some examples in five buckets. Commu communications, product distribution, people, and data. I have no question that this room can come up with a lot more than I did, but use them. It's your creative palette. And brands have the ability to change the world. Thank you, BJ. Hack like a champion. Thank you. Sure. That was great. All right, we're going now to um, Andrew. Can we pull the house lights up? I want to let's get some more light in the room. And I want everybody, with the exception of the poor gentleman who was in a motorcycle accident in the back of the room, everybody stand up. If you're able to stand up, stand up. All right? Now, this is a big part of what ad tech is about. I want you to find somebody you don't know. Start looking around now. We're going to take a short break. We're going to, we have to do a transition up here. While we're taking the short break, I want you to find somebody you don't know. I want you to introduce yourself, and I want you to get to know them, because today's casual appoint, acquaintance might be tomorrow's business point partner. Go. All right.